Okay, so question, I typed all this in here. So when I finally get around to posting this to the solutions folder after I clean up my other stuff, in case someone doesn't have the book, uh, state the three motivating criteria that define information entropy, try to express each in your own words. So um, I'm not sure how well I did it expressing my own words. It was hard to find synonyms for all of this, but the measure of uncertainty should be continuous. In other words, if you, a small, oh, little typo there, change. Improbability should not lead to a big change in uncertainty. So I guess it's like the idea of being a continuous function, no big jumps. Uh, the measure of uncertainty should be directly correlated to the possible number of events, um, which I think just intuitively makes sense. And the last one didn't jump out to me as being quite as intuitive, the measure of uncertainty being additive. But I guess like when I think back to maybe chapter two, I guess that makes sense. Um, so if we measure uncertainty about a set of events, then, and then we measure uncertainty about a different set of events. So we would, the uncertainty over both set of, of events would be the sum of the uncertainties over each of the sets. Yeah, I, that one also didn't make sense to me as much. Like, especially the example he gave, which was different meteorological. So it was cold, oh, hot, yeah. rain, rain. Which, yeah, which are not really necessarily independent. Right. Yeah. It, it, yes, it's true. Like, uh, yeah, I wonder if he was giving a simplistic example that he thought was more simple than it actually was. I don't know. Because yeah. as you pointed out, it's not really independent, those events. That's what I said for the third one is that the complexity of independent outcomes should be the sum. Oh, I like that. It's very um, concise. Because if they're not independent, then then it, it does then it should not be the sum because it might be the same actually if they're completely dependent. Just different That's true. measures of the same thing. And I, I had a little bit different answer for number two, because I think it's not exactly the number of possible events, but the I, I called it the complexity of the situation because you could have um, like three events where, where only one of them is, is at all likely versus two events that are equally likely. And I think you would get a um, higher entropy for the the one with two events. Um, yeah, you might be right. I'm just looking at the three criteria he gave. Is that, is that how he expressed it? He says the measure of uncertainty should increase as the number of possible events increases. I, I will say sometimes I think he uses a very colloquial style. Yeah. Um, in writing, and I, I appreciate that on the one hand because you know there's this very heavy material sometimes, and I think it makes it a little bit more easy, but a little bit easier, yeah. but maybe guess, that was too simple, too simplified. Um, because I can see, yeah, there are some entropy. I think number two and three are his, the his entropy example problems. on number two is sort of two events that are equally likely or three events that are equally likely. And then mm -hmm. it does make sense. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that <clears throat> that's a very good point, Kent, uh, because in all, all his on um, the Calvert's examples, he assumes they're equiprobable. So, yeah. and in the examples in this section, yeah, and independence. Okay. Uh, this is just a basic coin is weighted such that when it is tossed and lands on a table, comes up heads seventy percent of the time. What is the entropy? So I just basically used what looked like he was doing in the book. Pretty simple, right? Create a vector probabilities negative sum of p times the log of p and this i think this was actually the same probability yeah, it actually has the exact same code in exactly the point six one um and i guess it might be interesting to kind of vary that and see how that changes right so question three is a four-sided die with those probabilities on the screen what is the entropy so again basically creating those vectors right that vector i'm sorry and then doing the same thing so definitely higher, right? You have more outcomes. So that kind of maybe goes along a little bit to point one and then or the point two of question one. Mm -hmm. And then each of those, of course, outcomes has a, you know, less chance of actually happening. And in the case of two. Um, okay, so question E4 is basically, this is a little bit more complex. So 
basically a force. This is a, uh, a weird question and you have a four sided die, but it never shows four. So I'm trying to imagine such a thing. You know, it reminded me of, I think Kent, you mentioned the panda bear example, right? With the species, there was no, oh, they, right. they were certain there were two species, but there's really no way to tell them apart. But they were like, certain that they had different, two different species. It's like functionally, yeah, exactly. Twins. Functionally, how can we actually imagine this? But whatever, let's assume that this this thing exists. So, as he mentions, you kind of the little trick. Obviously, the log of zero, right? Doesn't not defined, right? So you have to just basically say drop that probability for which there is zero. And in the interest of accuracy, I just use one third instead of 0.33. And then we apply the same formula. So it's pretty much kind of a plug and chug sort of formula. Um, I guess while I'm sharing, I'll go over my definition, my question medium one, and whoever wants to share that, I'll stop sharing and you can share or just comment. Uh, so basically write down and compare the definitions of AIC and WAIC, which is most general, which assumptions are required to transform the more general criterion into a less general one. So AIC is this formula here. Uh, let's see, LPP, log point predictive density. So I was trying to, as I was reading, trying to wrap my mind around, you know, some of these things. It's kind of like, log, you know, the different um, log probability versus log point predictive density, all that kind of stuff. So this is the log probability score, the posterior distribution of a model, the training sample. Based on what I found in the text, LPPD is the log point predictive density. Um, so and then the two I think he mentioned is uh, for the P is a number of free parameters, which I will say sometimes P is used for probability and then other times it's used for parameters. So mm. you really kind of have to, I guess, keep that straight. But the two is a historical scale, just put in there for scaling. So didn't really think of a better way to say this when he said, AIC tells us the dimensionality of the posterior distribution is a natural measure of the model's overfitting tendencies. So I'm curious, I'm going to stop here. If either of you two in more, I'm not sure plain English is the right word, but just a uh, less, little less jargony. I mean, I, I guess it's saying like dimensionality of like how, how many parameters we're estimating. Um, posterior distribution is basically okay the more parameters the more the model is um overfit is more likely to overfit maybe uh what do you yeah, all think okay exactly okay that's kind of what i was told aicc i think has uh like obviously that's the corrected one which i was taught to use for the bayesian information is, criterion is which surprisingly a, he doesn't spend a lot of time on the bayesian information criterion <laughs> so is that quote that you have is, is that from him or did you find that somewhere else no that's from that's from the book okay um, i can't i don't remember what page to be honest uh so yeah i'm sure you can find oh, it i see yeah a there bit. it is so yeah, I, I consider dimensionality oh. i mean that's what we're you know exploring is a is a posterior dimension or a, a parameter dimensional space and mm -hmm. I think that becomes more clear maybe when we get into MCMC. Um, yeah, that that's we're, in a couple of chapters, right? The, so. And the, so the, the sampled values from the posterior are sampling from this multidimensional space according to the posterior probability. Yeah, um, that's a very concise way to say that. I like it. Um, okay, so AIC is only reliable basically when the priors are flat or the likelihood dominates them. Not sure exactly. I guess it's saying that the, the, whatever, the likelihood is so much different from the priors that it doesn't, the, the priors are effectively flat. Yeah, um, or that you have a lot of data, I think. It's yeah, really that's like true. It. Yeah, that's a good point, a lot of data. Uh, the posterior distribution is more or less multivariate Gaussian, um, which of course, as we see in some of our examples, we cannot always assume that. And then kind of going to your other point, the sample size is much larger than the number of parameters. So, um, so that's not super general in the sense that there's a lot of criteria, um, a lot of conditions, I guess, to be able to use it and get a reliable 
something that would actually be useful in your analysis. <clears throat> so widely applicable information criterion um, does not make any assumptions about the shape of the posterior. So it will, interestingly, it will, um, the out of sample deviants, um, so like D test, I guess it would be, converges to the cross validation estimate in a large sample. So that was kind of interesting. So that's basically the formula there. You can see that in the book. So I just said the WAIC as its name implies is more widely applicable. <laughs> Maybe I was underthinking that one. So Kent, I'm curious to hear what you came up with for this question. Well, I'm, I'm kind of laughing at myself because I didn't actually see that that section in the, the book that's talking about the limitations of AIC that you quoted the three limitations. So I went doing treating this as a research problem. And oh, okay, cool. Let's, let's do, you want me to, do you want me to stop sharing if you want to uh, share your screen um, and show us what you had? Sure, it's not very much, but sure. sure. Um, let's see. Um, So, I mean, <laughs> I really feel a little bit silly, but what I did, I wrote down the definitions and I tried to look at them and say, well, which one is more general? It's like, well, the AIC seems pretty specific. So I'm guessing that WAIC is more general, but let's do a little Google search. And I found actually this paper. Um, Interesting. Which compares, I, I should, well, let's see if I, Click on that as it can go there. And of course, you can't see because I didn't share that window. Um, hang on. All right, let's just go screen sharing. I hope I don't have anything here for you to not see. <laughs> um, but understanding predictive information criteria. And he actually sort of contrasts um, AIC, DIC, WAIC. And I guess pretty far into the weeds. I mean, Andrew Gelman is, well, all, at least Gelman and Vettari, they're two of the big people behind Stan and sort of modern Bayesian inference. Um, Gelman and collaborators literally wrote the book on it. Um, the Bayesian, I forget. Anyway, if you come down a ways here, you get to W, I see. Anyway, let me go back to here because the, the um, money quote that I found was this, which is giving the conditions where the WAIC basically converges to the AIC. Um, and it's kind of the same things that you were reading, large sample size, well, known variance, unif uniform prior. So we don't have known variance in um, McElrath, but- um, He says Gaussian, multi, approximately multivariate Gaussian. And then what else does he say? Flat yeah. priors. So, Which I mean, that's kind of uniform sort of- Uniform prior is a flat, that is a yeah, flat prior. Yeah, that is a flat prior. So yeah, that's, that's so, similar. And I, I couldn't really follow the reasoning. I'm not sure he gave a lot of reasoning. So I just took this as an as a assertion by the experts that that's where it starts to be the same. And the reason why is that this term here, the second term in the WIC converges to P basically mm -hmm. as, as these um, conditions are met. What is the, the theta, um, the Y sub I given theta? He, you know, maybe, maybe I need to look that up, I, or I forgot it. So this uh, is for, for each Y sub I, yeah. It looks at the variance of the log probability that Y gotcha. sub I. Um, which in this, so this is the likelihood, the log likelihood yeah. of each individual observation given the parameters, given the model, and then looking at the variance. So it, for each Y sub I, to compute this, you, you have to take your samples from the posterior, which gives you multiple values of theta, because this is the variance over theta. So you compute um, log P, the, the, um, the log likelihood of Y for all the different val 
sampled values of theta and then take the variance of that. Okay. Does that make sense? He shows it on- um, Yeah, I mean, it's been a while since I, um, you know, when th I'm reading all these terms, right? That I have marginal prior familiarity with, or it's been a while. So I, it's been about like 10 plus days since I read this. <laughs> so yeah, so if you go to- It's unfortunate. not super fresh. 222 of the book, there's an overthinking. He shows how it's calculated and says, we need in the second blue box, the header of that, we need to look oh, yes, at the each observation at each sample. So that's what that part is. And then, um, where does he take the variance? And then he doesn't, he takes the variance it, of that. He doesn't go into the, the th to the theta, right? Very much the P, Y sub I given, that's a small theta, I guess. The theta, theta is the parameters. So that's, um, uh, you, not, that's, not, you mean the theta as in the Y sub I given theta or the theta is the posterior distribution, which is the WAIC is a function of Y in the posterior distribution. Um, I'm sorry, say that again. So if you look at, oh yeah, sorry. If you look at the formula on page 220, right? For WAIC, he writes it as, as a function, it's basically a WAIC is a function of Y and then the, the, I guess I call it like the big theta. There's like, um, I guess the version of capitalized. Left. Yeah, that's capital theta. Capital theta, yeah. So that's the post, the capital theta is the posterior distribution. The lowercase theta, y sub i given theta, I guess is the, mm -hmm. just the given par the parameters or in the it's penalty the term. So the draw it's, from the posterior. The draw from the posterior. Okay, that makes more sense. It's the like, or it's, no, what were you saying? Ken? It's the variance with theta. So it's looking at, yeah, as, I mean, theoretically, it's looking at um, the, the, the distribution of theta and, com and computing this and figuring out the variance. And we do that by taking draws from the posterior, which are basically approximating the, um, the distribution of theta. Well, what, I guess I'm trying to say, what is theta, the small theta, essentially? Maybe I'm not picking up what you're trying to say. Yeah, well, it, I'm sort like of in plain I'm, English, I guess. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, perhaps that's not possible to to do. I'm kind of thinking of this. It's sort of like almost like in an integral where you have, you know, the integral of x dx. This is almost like mm -hmm. the dx, where it's it's the thing that's varying, and then somehow you're summarizing over all the variation of that. Okay. And the so in theory, it's the it's what would be the variance of this value given the distribution of theta. We don't know the true distribution of theta. We have samples from the distribution of theta. And so if we calculate this at those samples and take the variance of that, that gives us an approximation of what would be the, the true value. Yeah, I get the idea. I get the, the, that it's a variance parameter. I'm just trying to say little theta in you know plain English. That's more my question, so. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's across all the values of theta. No, and I get I, that, but I'm saying what is theta? Yeah. It's the parameters, it's, it's the set of parameters. Okay, well then, okay, the, maybe I wasn't asking that clearly. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously we have the posterior distribution and then the set of parameters, I guess those are related. I'm, I'm just trying to kind of figure out Obviously, he uses large, big theta for WAIC as a function of y as a function of the posterior distribution and as a function of the posterior distribution. And then he uses small theta for each individual y sub i given a small theta, right? So I don't know. Maybe I need to just sit, read some more up about it. Yeah, I think you have to read it with the variance sub theta because mm -hmm. that's sort of saying across all the thetas that are in big theta. Mm -hmm. According to their distribution, what's the variance of log p? Okay, yeah, yeah. That's why I say it's it's sort of like an integral or a summation where you're mm -hmm. your the the ver theta is qualifying the whole rest of that. You know, it's qualifying this whole thing. So it's the variance for overall theta of this value. Mm -hmm. 
all little theta, all theta in the according to the distribution of big theta. Okay, well, I appreciate that. I hope it helps. Maybe if you look through the code on 222, that might help. I don't know. It shows at least, you know, how he's computing it. Yeah, it's, oh yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna have to, I'll probably have to sit down with that. I think that'll make more sense, so cool. Yeah, just, I feel like we're kind of at wit's end with this one, but I, the, I think a simple analogy that makes it easy to understand easier is just by analogy with like capital X, meaning the random variable X or your collection mm -hmm. of uh, yeah. independent variables. So that would be capital theta. And then, yeah. and then you can move down to small x for each realization of x. And here we move to lowercase theta for each realization, for each individual drop in the posterior. Okay, that's, that yeah. that makes sense. That's kind of that's kind of what if I was wondering it was going in that direction, but I wasn't sure. So that's a great yeah. way to think about it. And then and you're that, looking at the variance of the that calculated thing across the individual realizations. Yeah, at the individual theta. like maybe not sample is the right word, but I guess if we're thinking about why sub i here, thinking yeah, I think observation. I think they are samples. They are yeah. samples from the posterior. So you can- The thetas are samples, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the okay. These and okay. gods would, would smile upon your phrase. Good. And I always, it's like, I, one needs to be very careful with language. And sometimes I have an intuition behind something, but I'm like, okay, how do I express this succinctly and accurately, so. Oh well, that's the that's the question, I guess. Oh well, look, I guess I did actually answer M two and M three. Um, oh well, you want to go through this? I didn't answer them. Sure. Uh, so explain. At least I tried. Explain the difference between model selection and model comparison. What information is lost under model selection? So model selection is picking a best, saying this is the best model, and I'm going with that. It just it's really it's picking one. Whereas model comparison let, looks at the differences between models and uses that as a way to help understand which parameters are important, what maybe are you missing? It helps you evaluate the models by seeing what the differences are. Um, and he also talks about um, it helping with causal inference, but I didn't really understand that part. So I, I left that out of my answer. Um, this is kind of, Coming from, where is it? Yes. By the way, this question is phrased differently in the PDF I have. Really? I had, I had to do a double take here. Yeah, and look, I oh. have, he talks about model averaging instead of model comparison. Do you have the oh. first edition? Or, uh, it, I think or the, you have the, okay, this yeah. PDF second edition. Huh. Yeah. Maybe. I thought I copied this out of the PDF that I have actually. Um, uh, well, yeah, I, I think I have, I have two different PDFs. One is more effective uh, than the other. Yeah, well, here's um, the one no, I have. One of them was like missing questions, like all the hard questions but, from one of the um, chapters, right? Yeah, chapter six and the one I have, mm -hmm. there's no hard questions. Um, and then there was that one where the, um, where it skipped a number in the book and the PDF. That was pretty funny. <laughs> I'm trying uh, to find yeah, <clears throat> he does come out pretty hard against model selection, which is kind of, a, it's an interesting hill to die on. Um, I don't really get that because at the end of the day, you got to, I mean, maybe this is my pragmatic side coming through and I'm not like scientific enough in this approach, but well, there it is. you have to select a model, right? Especially if you're going to well, predict. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. If you're doing prediction, you have to select a model. But if you're doing causal inference, that's true. Um, so he's here's what he says that I dropped out part. He says comparison is a more general approach that uses multiple models to understand both how different variables influence predictions. And in combination with a causal model, implied conditional independencies among variables help us infer causal relationships. So I guess that means. So if you have a model and it and it has a and it shows a conditional independence, one of the parameters doesn't enter into the model, basically. Mm -hmm. Then I guess you would say that's an implied conditional independence, and you would want to have a causal model 
that reflects that. So that makes sense. If you have multiple models, you can maybe yeah. see, you can find, like when we were talking with Mikhail about his um, research question, and it's like, well, if you want to learn this, you have to look at this. And if you want to learn that, you have to look at this other thing. And if you just do all the models and look at what are the, the implied conditional independencies, which I would say is where the parameter basically doesn't enter into the model. Mm -hmm. It has a it has a value that includes you know, a range that includes zero or, or is close to zero. Then you want to look at your, you would want to have a causal model that has also has that same implied conditional independence. And if your causal model says, no, this parameter should be super important, then you might want to reevaluate your causal you know, your DAG or whatever your causal model is. Oh my God, I actually think I understand this. <laughs> Does that make sense to anybody else? Because I'm the light bulbs going off in my head. Yeah. Uh, can I just want to ask what, what question, or sorry, what question, what page was that quote that you just read? It's on 226, uh, the third paragraph where he has the highlighted model comparison in, in blue. I don't know if you're looking at the PDF, it's going to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if this has the blue 226. No, yeah, no, I, I found it. Uh, all uh, right. That was a, a, good, a good phrase. Actually, it's funny, I have it highlighted in my text and I just forgot uh, about it. <laughs> That's like me not looking at his description of where AIC requires. Um, all right, should we go on? I think so. So the M3, when comparing models with an information criterion, why must all models be fit to exactly the same observations? What would happen to the information criterion values if the models were fit to different numbers of observations? Perform some experiments. So I just said these, there's, there's sums, both this, the LPPD term and the, this PWAIC term are sums over the observations and they're not normalized at all. So there's something that came to me like when I was not sleeping last night, actually, I think about normalization. The, going back to sort of how he comes up with these things, there's a place where you know, he's talking about um, divergence, um, you know, the, what is it, color, little, little KL, Kolbach, Liebler divergence, and then says, well, when you take the difference of these, it sort of simplifies out. And I think what simplifies out doesn't entirely simplify out. You have to kind of drop a normalization term maybe because you don't actually know the true probabilities. And so then these become relative measures. And there's some, since they're summed across the observations, if you, I mean, if you just dropped out some observations, clearly you're gonna get a different value here. Um, and quite possibly smaller. I mean, if you had 10 observations all the same, you would have 10 values the same. And if you dropped out half, you'd have five values the same and you would have half your, um, this term would become half as, as large. And mm -hmm. this one also would change. So that's that's basically my, my answer is that these are sums over observations and they're not normalized in any way. So if you change the observations or change the number of observations, there's, you're on, you're on a different scale. There's yeah, and you can't transform Y as well, so. Yeah. Um, wow, that's really interesting. I didn't think of that at all. So, and I think that's right. Well, actually, I had a funny thought process when you first said it. When you first said it by not being normalized, I didn't, realize that you meant have like an in or n minus one in the denominator. What I thought you were talking about was um, how he scales variables. And so if you're dependent oh. variables on a different scale, right? So like, yeah. so if you, if you measure Celsius versus Fahrenheit, yeah, those will no. have different variances. Yeah, that's not gonna change the variance of the, of the likelihood. Right. Um, which is what we're measuring here. Although the LPPD, I forget what that measures. That's, um, yeah, that's still, it's based on the, it's the log probability. 
Um, okay, I, yeah, I'll have to think about, is there, can you explain in a short way why there's no way that that would change if variables are on different scales? Um, well, because we're looking at, all right, so. Well, I, I see, I was always taught that if you have like a model with log, log Y versus Y, you can't compare the AIC between yeah. those. I you think know. just talking about standardization though, but if you think about it like a z-score, um, if you compute the, if you standard, if you, if you want to know the probability of some, some variable that you, that in a Gaussian distribution and your Gaussian and your distribution is not centered, then, um, you know, you'll use a mean of five and a variance of 10 or whatever. And then if you standardize, you'll have a mean of zero and a variance of one, but the probability of your observation won't change. The, the z-score is gonna be the same. You're, Cause you're still, you're still gonna fall in the same relative location in that Gaussian bell mm -hmm. curve. You know, if you're in the middle, you'll still be in the middle. If you're on the, you know, the one standard deviation out, you're still gonna be one standard deviation out. And what this, the log p, that's the height of the, um, the probability curve. So when you're, when you're standardizing your variables, you're scaling the whole thing horizontally, but you're not changing the height at, at, each, at each observation. You're just moving it, moving it all around on the x scale. Yeah, I think though that like logarithmic is different, right? Because that's it's more different. of like a magnitude yeah. transformation, but yeah, like Celsius versus Fahrenheit, right? That's not gonna um, make a so difference. Your, your theta will just be different. Your, just, your parameter distribution mm -hmm. will be different, but the, the probabilities should be the same. Okay, you, you convinced me. Okay. Yay! <laughs> um, but okay, so then, then I want to see if you can what well, you think about another thing. So when I so now we're going to go further back in time to when I answer this question. What I was thinking about. Um, so well, first of all, I I don't know how important this is, but I noticed that when he wrote the question, so in the wording, there seemed to be two pretty different questions. Like the first question. So, you know, he says when using models uh, with an information criterion or when comparing models, sorry, with an information criterion. Now, the first question is why must all models be fit to exactly the same observation? So, in that, my mind's like, oh, he's talking about sampling variability because exactly the same observations. He doesn't think about number of observations. And then the second one, he says, what would happen to the information criterion values if the models were fit to different numbers of observations? And so, to me, it's just like these are two completely different questions. That's true. And, and so the first one to me just kind of wasn't interesting in the sense of like, even R squared, just, you know, like the first measure of fit that I think most people, I myself include to learn, that'll, that will change depending on the sample. Um, if they're just two random draws, you know, from sample, holding sample size constant. But so then I was focusing more on N, which I think is what everyone did. Um, and, I was wondering about, so, you know, as, um, so our, our parameter distributions for theta will become narrower as we have more data, right? We can more precisely estimate mm -hmm. uh, our parameters. Yeah. So I was thinking, is that, I wonder if he was thinking when, you know, he envisioned a diligent student mm -hmm. answering this, uh, having us think about that. So that the variance might change. Exactly. That that we as we get more observations, the variance is going to get tighter, which is going to make that penalty shrink. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I thought of. So so I think can your answer is much more smart. <laughs> well, uh, there, there is more both... nuanced. I think it's a, a valid point. Well, except no, because we're looking at the variance of the log likelihood, not the variance of the parameters. 
Right. So there, but I wonder, I mean, with that, with the variance of the log likelihood, not, I mean, I just can't see, I, yeah, you I don't know. know. I, I, I Wouldn't that go down that. though as sample size increases? I mean, it's going to be that distribution is going to be tighter, right? But wait, um, which which distribution? The 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 posterior distribution of the parameters, right? The those right. The distribution of theta is going to have mm -hmm. a smaller variance. Smaller. But that's not what we're measuring here. We're measuring the distribution of the log Pro likelihood of the observations. And I'm not that's sure. fair. Yeah, I'm not. I don't no, have as good an intuition about that. Um, but I, I mean, my gut though tells me that as you get more information, as your your parameters are more tightly measured, you're going to have a better sense of the vary the variance of that log likelihood. Yeah, but that's I'm, just gut intuition. I'm thinking about so. Um, I'm just thinking about my my mental picture of a, a Gaussian distribution and a bunch of samples across that think, you know, thinking back to like some of the very early pictures where there's, you know, showing samples that are near the like the high likelihood and that are less high likelihood. And so the, the likelihood of the samples is the height of the, of the Gaussian distribution mm -hmm. at each point. And if you have more samples, then the distribution is going to get narrower, which I could see might actually increase the variance in, in the log likelihood, because you're going to have, if you have things that are near the center, they're actually going to become closer to the tails of the distribution, and you might have a wider variance. I don't know. It's not, it's not clear to me. Maybe we have to do some experiments here and see what happens to that term specifically or to the individual variances. Um, I mean, if, if you're right that the variance of the likelihood gets smaller, then that's going to be in the opposite direction of just having more, more items in the sum. So they're going to be tending to pull the, the WASC in opposite directions if, if you're correct about what happens to the variance. Um, but it would still be something that would contribute to them not being comparable. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I do think a simulation is in order. Yeah. Oof. But so yeah, so actually I thought this is kind of funny. I don't know if I of you have ever noticed this. Yeah, I'm, I'm writing this down <laughs> so I can remember what happens when we increase the sample size. <laughs> To the law, the variance of the law like yeah what happens so, to the, the individual variances not the sum of all the variances uh, you know i i feel like this question is probably harder than all the hard questions to be honest <laughs> I, I i noticed that it happens occasionally where authors i think will just somehow i've even noticed that in other cases where there'll be an easy question which like if you think about is much harder than a hard question. It happens quite frequently. Yeah. But that's not super for germane to this. Oh, oh, we lost Laura. Uh oh. I think she'll be back. Um, I was going to suggest we go on to M4, yes. which I don't have an answer to. Uh, yeah, M4, seven, M4. Oh, well, this is as a prior becomes more concentrated. So this is related to what you were just talking about. All right, we've, we moved on to M4. Okay, I my internet connection is really bad today. So y'all are kind of going in and out. I know I've dropped a couple of times. So sorry if I missed anything. Um, okay, did you, did you have an answer to M4? No, I just did M1 and then H1 and okay. sort of two. Do you want to talk through these? I could, this, this actually seems sort of related to what we were just talking about. Um, Cause we were talking about the, um, the posterior becoming more concentrated. Mm -hmm. And then when the prior becomes more concentrated then the posterior would become more concentrated mm -hmm. as, as yeah. well. That makes sense. Um, 
So this would be then an interesting experiment because you don't have to vary the number of observations mm -hmm. and to get a narrower um, posterior. And that's where we would then answer the question of what happens to the variance. That's true. So I'm guessing it's going to go down because that's what this is what reg, it's regularization. Mm -hmm. So that makes me guess that Justin's intuition is right, that the variance decreases. Um, but that's just a guess. I mean, you mean when we increase sample size? No, when you, well, yeah, as you, if you increase sample size, then the variance for the or number of observations, I should say number of observations, sample size would be different, obviously the oh, data, the small data, right. but. Different sample size. Yeah, so increasing number of observations will also decrease the posterior variance. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. de and concentrating the prior will decrease the posterior variance. So I would say maybe both of those will decrease the variance of the log likelihood of the individual observations. Which is interesting because if you have a tighter, you could specify theoretically any prior you wanted, right? So you could have a very tight prior and get a better AIC score or WIC score, right? Um, yeah, well, and then, depending on what happens to the first term, which is that's the one true. that's oh, measuring that's how good the fit is. Well, that's true. That's true. So there's those two computing, competing Yeah, competing this is things. just asking what so. happens to the second term. Oh. Yeah. So I think we need to do some experiments. Yeah, I also need to read more. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, yes, the experiments we also good. need to read chapter eight and watch the videos <laughs> and do the exercises for chapter eight. So it's yeah. a little, little shorter anyway. Um, sometimes, sometimes I feel like you don't fully understand what is being said until like a couple chapters later. It's like, oh, yeah, that's how this all ties in, right? At least for me, but. Uh, real quick, do we, do we want to go to, so I didn't find the last two medium ones super enlightening and I know Laura did seven, Hard to yeah, warm, I'm thinking so. maybe we should jump to, to Laura's presentation of H1. Okay, yeah. Justin, do you want to present? I know you said you did those two, oh, so okay. I don't want to. No, I, wanna... got, I, did, I didn't knit a document and and uh, an aggravating factor. I have my RStudio theme set to like uh, steampunk night life hard on the eyes okay i didn't i didn't even realize that you could do that i'm just like really basic with my r studio theme so okay pretty, okay then well i don't have too. it on steampunk thank so. you Those light on dark themes are very hard for me to read yeah yeah so take the floor Laura. okay so you're gonna see me uh i have no idea if i really approach this in a decent way but um you know, it seems somewhat intuitive to me. So basically, if you look at the book, you see that very crassly drawn quadratic curve on those yeah. tax data. I mean, somebody was having some real imagination going on there. I'm just going to say that. Um, the so thing is this was so influential. I know, because it was, was the, Wa the Wall Street Journal, right? It was like, this is oh sort of God. the basis of Reaganomics. Oh, it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, basically, a Bally fit curve made the argument that the relationship between tax rate and tax revenue increases, increases and then declines, which so essentially like an inverted quadratic function, right? Um, so you're going to fit a curve to these data using the Laffer data, which are only 29 observations. So it's a pretty small data set. Unfortunately, we don't have information about which country is, goes with which observation. So he says to consider models that use tax rate to predict tax revenue, compare using WAC or PSIS, just more like the leave one out type of uh, criterion, a straight line model to any curved models you like. What do we conclude about the relationship between tax rate and tax revenue? So the first thing I did, right, is I wanted to just plot this myself 
get an idea of like without any of the like the tiny little thing and as you can see um yeah, by, by you put your console you away yeah i'll let me do smaller. it bigger thank you um Thanks. there we go yeah so as you can see you've got what looks to like the naked eye to be an outlier up there wow they brought in a lot of tax revenue I'm yeah. curious which country that is. And like I said, I wish we kind of knew because I might be like, oh, that's why. Like maybe they have a lot of oil or something like that, right? And then you have this one over here. So the first observation, curiously, had negative tax revenue, which I'll explain these variables. These are various transformations and standardizations I did to fit some different models. I am not sure what happened. Um, and again, if I knew the situation, I'd be curious to kind of deal with that, but that makes it's a little complicated money. Yeah, a little complicated. So they have a really tiny little tax rate, rate and they also lost money. So I say, my opinion, not really quadratic relationship. So we're going to start out with estimating a quadratic model. Um, me looking at this, I'm seeing more of a logarithmic relationship potentially, if that, right? Obviously we have a couple outliers there, maybe a linear regression it would be a very presumably pretty flat slope although the outlier would potentially be influential. So first thing I'm doing right is I just create a new um, squared taxes squared variable, then I standardize that. So that is in here, this variable, right? Standardized. And these are the original ones of these standardized. Um, and then if it, right, just using the Gaussian, um, you know, quadratic. Don't really do much with the priors, probably could, but I didn't really give it a lot of thought. So, um, so you look at the posterior summary, let me pull that up. Here's some birds in the background. Is Justin, you sitting outside? That's nice, <laughs> okay. Uh, or maybe, I don't know, maybe it's one of you, maybe you can. But um, so you can see, right, we've got, uh, we have here this, uh, this is just the X variable, this is the X squared essentially. And really like a really wide range here, right? Um, zero is kind of like in this one, the square term, zero is smack dab. And I know we look at the whole distribution, right? Not a point estimate, but it's kind of smack dab in the middle of that um, distribution. So that kind of makes me a little suspect if I was already inclined to be a little suspect. Um, so then I, um, interestingly, you can run this, um, in this function, you can run this and find that the 12th observation has that bad threshold, right? That we, for the Pareto, the, the IDs. Um, the 12th observation, right, is no surprisingly that one that was like the 10, I guess that's millions, I don't know, billions, whatever, of tax revenue. So that's kind of, when we use it, when we assume a Gaussian distribution, we're getting um, kind of crazy stuff. So this is basically the BRMS version of PSIS, right? I started out, and I should have kept this in there, but I started out with using the WAIC. I thought, well, you know, he uses that more, but then I get this warning message. You have a threshold, you know, threshold greater than 0.7. So I look it up and yeah intuition about it being an outlier was definitely right. So now what I said, okay, well, I'll go back to the drawing board. I'll do, um, assume it's student distribution, right? And then let's see here, if you want to see that. Um, right, so we don't get the same, uh, there's, I can run this, it doesn't, nothing comes up as having that bad threshold. Again, we get a really wide, um, <laughs> really wide distribution here. Uh, the parameters uh, with zero, certainly quite in the middle is a very plausible value. So then I go to say, okay, maybe a linear model, possibly a log linear or linear log, or I guess we could do a double log. I didn't get around to that. Uh, might be better options. So the log dependent variable model though is complicated by the fact that we do have a negative value for tax revenue in the first observation, right? Not to mention, it makes it a little harder to compare the information criteria when you do that kind of transformation, which I thought it should have thought about before I did it, but oh well, it didn't end up being that great of a model anyways. 
So what I do here is I transform the log of the, the tax rate, then I standardize that. And then let's run this just so you guys can kind of see what's going on here. So yeah, it's kind of like, <laughs> You have everything over it's here. Close. You have this one over here, and now, yeah. Then you have that one up here. So uh, I'm not, I'm not super enthusiastic about the probabilities for this one. But you know, you got to try it, right? So, but I estimate the model. I sticking with the student distribution. It's like there's no way that that's not going to throw some problems with just using a Gaussian, right? So, um, oops. So yeah, look at this. Um, interestingly though, we do, so this, this variable is we don't have, not that it matters, we do not actually have zero, right? For this being the log transformed tax rate. So that's, um, then I of course adding the criterion to the, to the model uh, for the PSIS and we will compare these later on. So I said, finally, it wasn't actually finally, um, or I guess I, yeah, well, the near model. So I did a little bit of probably some shit I shouldn't have done, <laughs> to be honest, because I had to deal with that negative 0.06. I didn't want to exclude it. Obviously, you can't compare as we, if you have different number of observations, right? But um, I'm taking here, I'm just doing a linear model. Let's take, the, I don't know why I put V. I think I must have been a typo. Okay. So let's take a look at that. Just out of curiosity. Um, yeah, you know, it's eh, zeros towards the, the tails of that, right? So, which would be kind of interesting if there's like really no relationship. Um, so then I'm saying, okay, I want to try a log linear model because it sort of looks like that might be something. So what I'm doing here is I'm, um, let's see, so I tax revenue. Um, what was I doing? God, I'm trying to remember. What I was doing. Taking the logs and I'm taking the log. I'm trying to remember when I replaced it. Yeah. So then I got a not a number here, right? As you'd imagine. So then I thought, okay, yeah, I'm fudging a little bit with this, and this is probably not good practice, but it's a homework problem. So saying, okay, that first observation, right? I'm going to replace that with the log of a very small number. So I do that, then I standardize it. So now this was kind of interesting, looking at where we have the log linear model here. Again, you got that little outlier down there. <laughs> now I said, there really isn't much relate. I mean, it's practically a horizontal line, right? Am I just looking yeah. at it from my perspective? Um, so then I, I wanted to get a better view of this to say, hey, maybe the, I'm not seeing something here because we have it's accommodating. So I just said for visualization purposes, let's take out that first observation. I mean, I'm not really seeing, you got a lot of just, I mean, maybe you kind of fit something like that, right? Maybe kind of a very kind of a log, but mm, it's certainly not like a, a very, a slope of a, of a lot of magnitude. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm actually gonna have to go because I have a okay, call, yeah. call with my boss at three. Yeah, don't um, wanna miss that. Okay, sounds no. good. So I will finish up here shortly. So chapter, um, chapter eight next week. Sounds good. Okay, see you then. Okay, you. talk to Bye. you later. Bye -bye. Okay, so yeah, Justin, you can probably get what I'm doing here, right? And then, uh, let's see. So this one, I didn't even really need to fit this one because I can't compare it. It's pretty tightly measured, interestingly, right? Very tightly measured, actually. But um, do you think that that's just because of the scale? It's, it's probably is, honestly. Yeah. So I'm yeah. not, so then I do this, the coup de gras, so to speak, is, uh, well, the whole purpose is, like you said, compare, right? Compare the model. So uh, after trying to put the log linear model in, it threw me a, the Y is not the same. And I was like, oh shit, that's right. I remember that from, you know, um, econometrics. So I took that one out, but I, all these different models I wrote, and then I'm doing the criterion being that PSIS. So the linear log model was the one with the, I guess you could say the lowest, right? So that's the 69. And not surprisingly, our quadratic is the worst. <laughs> so I don't know if there's any definitive answers that come from that, but 
that was how I approached it. And that's why I said I kind of combined question one and two, because I think in question hard two, he says, try using different, uh, measure the importance of the outlier, T distribution, robust regression, right? So um, I, I kind of looked at some of those questions for chapter two, but that's all I got. Uh, I'll stop sharing. You know, interestingly, so I, like I said, I did this as well. And I, when I did, so I just did linear model, quadratic model, uh, and I got a lower WAIC for the quadratic model. Interesting. I'm trying to remember, what did I, what did I just look at? Which one was lower? Yeah, well, the quadratic T definitely is, looks like it's, it is a little bit better than the linear T. So yeah, I mean, I'm kind of seeing that too. <laughs> I didn't yeah, even I didn't... do a linear model without the T, but I'm guessing it would probably be, you know, given the same distribution, it'd probably be worse. So I don't know. And it, maybe I don't want to hear that, right? It's like, oh, I want to say that stupid quadratic <laughs> isn't right. Well, but, yeah, but the thing is that, um, let me see, I'm just going to share my screen for a second. So this is um, sure. this is the long, long one. So yeah, but so what I found, I, mean, I guess we should wrap up because we're over, over time, is so so like these are what, and I'll also minimize my console. Oh, nice. Uh, she does some really cool plots there. Um. I mean, it's just the plot and then with three linear regressions superimposed, a linear blue, quadratic red, and uh, this tan cubic. And uh, one thing that I mean, now is like super obvious that, but I find interesting is just when the data is sparse, like in the, mm -hmm. uh, that's when like the, <laughs> the, the polynomial terms like really just have fun. Like they're just like, yeah. yep. Got that point, got it. <laughs> it's like this point basically got it. Um, mm -hmm. But but the thing that um, I guess I wanted to point out that was actually relevant to the question is that because there's quite a bit of data in this tax rate range, there's no way to get a polynomial to actually touch the point, like in yeah. the graph that is supplied by the Wall Street Journal. Yeah, so, no, I agree that uh, something's going on with one. that country. And my guess is maybe it's an oil rich country or something. There's got, there's probably a lot of like natural resources. Um, that's my guess. Um, yeah. And it's, it's not typical though. And that's of course why it's an outlier. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. That, that, uh, <laughs> that, uh, polynomial, the, the cubic, um, one. Oh yeah. I, I need to learn more GD plot too. That's my thing I need to do. Cause I am, that's one of my areas I'm weakest on the tidy versus visualization. So yeah, I'm like, I really like your plots though. Those are very, really easy to kind of see the craziness. Yeah. That, that polynomial, <laughs> holy crap. Yeah. Yeah. That's so that's not... actually what made me think about it. Cause like, this is a super wild, like just imagine plotting this and like yeah. trying to convince someone that that's that's a, a real phenomenon. Like, oh yeah, you're just gonna have this crazy if, thing if you go from like zero to, well, I guess this is law. I mean, you know. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, I mean that would be a pretty hard sell. Um, well, I mean, you could send that to the Wall Street Journal. They might. Uh, <laughs> there's, but there's not like you gotta you gotta find some country that you know would be around that tax rate or log of tax rate, log of tax revenue. Um, but yeah. The ironic thing is that cubic doesn't even hit the the outlier that's on the higher end of the tax rate spectrum. So exactly, it's like that was that was what most struck me is that there's just no way to get to that one. So like so so that's what like you know when I first read Mikawa's comment that like seemingly hand drawn right that that graph is seemingly hand drawn. Mm -hmm. I thought he meant that was his way of just saying it was bad. But now I, I realize that given that I have tried to like you know some variations some uh, yeah rescalings of the variable and also different terms. It, like that graph was hand-drawn in the sense of like, you cannot, oh, yeah. you cannot get that even with the wildest polynomial term because it would be like super squiggly and all sorts of weird stuff. And then it, there's someone who's just like, draw me a nice polynomial in an imaginary. Like, go through that um, point, yeah. yeah. Well, it's nice to, I, th I thought it was an interesting question, maybe just because it's more, a lot of these are more scientific and being more in, in the social sciences, it's like, especially economics specifically, it's like, uh, yes. So, 
Cool. Well, all right. I guess uh, next week we'll do chapter eight.